Namaste. Well, the climactic moment has come and gone. The Mars-Saturn conjunction was exact about 9.30 this morning, just about two hours ago. And it was intense, especially for me, because my Mars is exactly on that degree, the degree of Mars exaltation, 28 degrees Capricorn. And Mars is my Atmakarika. And <laughs> the conjunction is squaring Rahu and Neptune. So it was wild, it was intense. Last night, I could barely sleep. And what it showed me, it, it revealed a great deal about my path, how I got to this place and where to go from here. In other words, it was like a strategic awakening. Several people, Richard Clark and others, had the idea that on this conjunction, I would attain mononoia which means the destruction of the mind. And actually, this already happened. Back about uh, six years ago, I was flying from Oslo back to Colombo, and I got fourth path realization on the plane as it was descending into Dubai to make the connection for Sri Lanka. And my mind was just gone. It was blotto, there was nothing left. So unfortunately, because I was not in a supportive social situation at the time, I had to uh, very immediately take some action to rebuild some kind of mental structure, some kind of personality to deal with the world, because there's nobody who could deal with it for me. So I didn't get to enjoy the uh, prolonged state of silence that, for example, Ramana Maharshi or Bhagavan Nomi got to experience. I experienced it all right, <laughs> but it put me in a very awkward situation because there was no one to take care. So now also, in just a few days before this conjunction, I was forced to move because the place where I was staying they had to replace the roof before rainy season sets in. So <laughs> in the end, as usual, I wound up dealing with it all by myself without any help. Someone was supposed to visit Sri Lanka and uh, learn from me and be with me. And they also canceled. So, you know, this is just my karma. <laughs> anyway, so Mananoia happened already six years ago. So what this conjunction has been about for me is the final acceptance of Ahang Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. You know, I've been saying this for years, right? <laughs> I've been saying it actually for like 30 years, maybe longer. But the last five years, especially in studying Ramana Maharshi's teaching, I've been saying it a lot, both on the channel here and IRL. 
But there was always some lingering doubt that I had to go through some kind of transformation or add or subtract or change something or other about me to be able to say, I'm fully enlightened, I'm Bhagavan. And that doubt was destroyed over the last couple of days. Not by any meditation, or not by any sudden realization hitting like lightning out of the blue sky, but by studying Shankaracharya's commentary on Vedanta Sutra, to Shariraka Bhasya. And in there he says that there are uh, six misconceptions about attaining enlightenment. And we've been over this before in earlier series on Ramana Maharshi's books and so on. But I revisited the argument in its original form and in Shankara's wording, which is very powerful. And he says, basically, the whole idea of attainment of Brahman is imaginary. Why? Because we are already Brahman. <laughs> there isn't anything else but Brahman. Even Maya is Brahman. Even the imaginary body, mind, personality, ego, and so on. The senses, the experiences, everything is actually Brahman. So there's nothing to attain. And there's nobody to attain it, because only Brahman exists. So all theories about growth, transformation, attainment, some kind of acquisition of some special state, something like this, it's all imaginary. It's all imaginary, just like the body, the mind, our karma, cause and effect, time, space, you know, the whole material creation is just imaginary. It doesn't really exist because it's temporary. Real existence has no beginning and no end. So if you declare either way, oh, now I have attained enlightenment, or as of now, I have not yet attained enlightenment. Either way, Ramana Maharshi says, you open a broad field of uh, criticism because there is no attainment. Attainment means I was in one state and then I became uh, shifted into another state where I acquired a new state or a new state was added to me or my state was transformed from one to another. All imaginary because they're temporary. Anything that has a beginning also has an end. That means enlightenment or self-realization has to be both beginningless and endless. And the only way to meet that criterion is if it's already a done deal. It's already an existential fact. And there's nothing that we have to do except understand it and accept it. And of course, when the mind comes to that point, it says, oh, sorry, excuse me. I guess I'm not actually needed here. And then it goes away very humbly.
So self-realization then is not a matter of meditation or performing rituals or doing any kind of sadhana or anything like that. Those things are simply to remove the obstacles. What are the obstacles? The coverings of the self by maya. Maya means that which is not. So what is it that's not? The upadis, the coverings such as, I am an individual, I am a human being, this is my body, uh, this is my country, my name, all this nonsense. And then there are the vasanas. Vasanas means the habitual desires often uh, carry over from a previous life and uh, also the shankara. Shankara means preparations, fabrications, desires, or just plain old imagination. Stuff that we make up. Oh, I am a Buddhist, I am a Hindu, I am a Vedantist, I am enlightened, I am not enlightened, I am a man, I'm a woman, I'm this, I'm that. All kinds of imaginary thoughts and desires. The, uh, the Buddha begins his description of enlightenment, of Nibbana, by saying, Shankara Nirodho, meaning, when all shankaras, when all imaginary thoughts go away. And similarly, Patanjali begins his yoga sutras by saying, what is yoga? Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is when the changes of the mind, the modifications of the mind, into form. When consciousness assumes a form or a quality, we often compare consciousness to a mirror. If you put something red in front of a mirror, it turns red. If you put something square in front of it, it reflects a square. Similarly, consciousness, whatever you put in front of it, it will assume that form. So the point is, stop putting things in front of it and direct the attention of consciousness to itself. And we've discussed this in great detail in the Secret of the Golden Flower series and many other places. So these are keys to enlightenment, they're doors. The Buddha said, there's 80,000 Dharma doors, 80,000 ways to realize the self, or Brahman, or Nibbana, or the kingdom of God, or whatever you want to call it. Self-realization. Not that there's only one way, my way, or the highway. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Actually, when it comes down to it, every enlightened being has a unique way of attaining the state. Really, the attainment is only that one has reduced or eliminated all the distractions, all the coverings, all the maya that gets in the way of who we really are. So, when this happened yesterday, you know, there was no brass band, <laughs> no angels with trumpets descending from the heavens, no earthquakes. 
no big fanfare. In fact, it was very subtle. It was just like, oh, oh, okay. But it was accompanied by an ineffable bliss that has not left and will not leave. The bliss of being Brahman, Sat Chit Ananda. So now what? I'm making some plans how to continue this series and I will reveal those in just a little while. I want to discuss them with some friends first. And then we'll just keep on doing what we're doing. And hopefully uh, do a better job and give more help and assistance and encouragement to those who also want to realize the self. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shati Aung. Mm -hmm.